1999 has been a year of celebration for Virginia Tech. Perfect through seven games, the Hokies are making their claim for number one. The heart of the offense is quarterback Michael Vick, a dangerous runner and passer. He hopes to lead the Hokies to an undefeated season. The focus of the defense is sack specialist Corey Moore, whose playmaking ability has helped mold the Virginia Tech defenders into the best unit in the land. The Hokies have an excellent shot to make a run at the national championship. This season, the Mountaineers of West Virginia have been scratching their heads and pondering what might have been. Don Nealon's 20th season in Morgantown has been filled with near misses and close calls. His team is bruised, battered, and seeking redemption. But hope is on the horizon as quarterback Mark Bulger is finally healthy. And with a strong finish, the Mountaineers can still celebrate a winning season. It's Virginia Tech and West Virginia. It's November 6th, 1999. The 7-0 Virginia Tech Hokies are facing off against the 3-5 West Virginia Mountaineers. This game is being played in Morgantown, West Virginia, a place where the Hokies have struggled in the past. They are in pursuit of their first ever national title, and West Virginia is experiencing their worst season in a few years. On the surface, this might seem like just another college football game, but in reality it would go on to mean so much more. We'll start off with Virginia Tech. The Hokies were coming into this game at 7-0, and their hopes of making the national title game were still alive, but a loss in this game would almost certainly end those chances. Teams like Penn State, Tennessee, and Nebraska all played in bigger and better conferences than the Big East. And many critics argued that Virginia Tech just wasn't as good as these schools. A loss to a 3-5 West Virginia team would just prove their haters right. It wasn't like the Hokies' success was completely unexpected, though. They came into the season ranked 13th in the country, the highest ever for them. They were led by Frank Beamer, a man who was almost fired after a 2-8-1 season in 1992. Luckily, he figured it out, and the Hokies had made a bowl game every year since 1993. So coming into the 1999 season, expectations were high for Virginia Tech. They started out an impressive 7-0, and when I say impressive, it's not just because they hadn't lost a game. The Hokies led the country in scoring offense, with a slight 41.5 points per game, and their 455 total points was good for first in the country. They were led by Michael Vick, a redshirt freshman quarterback out of Newport News, Virginia. He was known for creating electric plays through the air and on the ground. He only managed to throw for 2,065 yards and 13 touchdowns, but he led the country in yards per completion, with 10.9. He also picked up 682 yards on the ground and ran for 9 scores. This game, and really season, would be crucial for Vic's legacy. Without a trip to the title game, would critics begin to question his ability to be a starting quarterback? He wasn't the only producer on this team, though. His favorite target, Andre Davis, led the team with 42 catches and 1,070 receiving yards. This put him at an average of over 25 yards per catch. Really think about that. This means that every time he caught the ball, the Hokies moved downfield over a quarter of the way to the end zone. Running backs Shiron Stiff and Andre Kendrick combined for nearly 2,000 yards on the ground. As good as their offense was, their defense might have actually been better. They were anchored by Corey Moore, a defensive end who would go on to win the Bronco Nagurski Trophy that season. He made it clear the Hokies were for real by issuing this iconic quote after a 31-11 Thursday night drubbing of Clemson. In 1999, the Hokies had the third best rush defense, seventh best passing defense, and third best total defense in the country. They also led the country in scoring defense, allowing opponents to score just a measly 10.5 points per game. The point is, they were stacked. They were ranked third in the country, the highest they had ever been. They had knocked off Big East rival Pittsburgh 30-17 the week before, and two weeks prior, they had clubbed number 16 Syracuse 62 to nothing in what still remains as the biggest blowout in college game day history. All of this meant that in theory, this 3-5 West Virginia team should have just been another bug on their metaphorical windshield. The Mountaineers had other plans though. 1999 was a frustrating season for West Virginia. They were in the midst of their worst overall season since 1996. They had finished a combined 15-9 in 1997 and 1998. Now, it seemed like all of the momentum they were building was disappearing before their eyes. They lost their opener to ECU 30-23, but rebounded against Miami, Ohio. They then proceeded to lose the next four games. Wins in two of their next three had them sitting at an overall 3-5 record. They were mediocre in every sense of the word. 
Their defense ranked 98th in the country, and the offense wasn't much better at 63rd. Quarterback Mark Bolger led the offense. Overall, they were a pretty middle-of-the-road team. This is a rivalry game, though, which means that you can leave all logic and common sense at the door. The Black Diamond rivalry has been played for a total of 52 times. West Virginia leads the series 28-23-1. The two teams met annually every year from 1973 to 2005, before conference realignment and TV deals put the series on hold. West Virginia dominated the rivalry in the 80s, winning 8 of 10 total matchups. But the Hokies had found more success in the new decade, winning 6 of 10 against the Mountaineers. Overall, it was a pretty competitive rivalry. Virginia Tech won the toss and deferred. West Virginia elected to take the football, Jimmy Kibble's kickoff. West Virginia received the opening kickoff and proceeded to go 3 and out. Virginia Tech got the ball and proceeded to punt it right back to West Virginia. On the Mountaineers' next possession, they proceeded to punt it right back to Virginia Tech. I'm starting to notice a pattern here. The teams would open the game with a combined nine punts. This seemingly unstoppable Virginia Tech offense had seemingly been stopped. For the first time all season, they had been held scoreless in the first quarter. The first points of the game came with seven minutes and five seconds to play in the second. Andre Kendrick got the ball and dashed 46 yards down the sideline for Virginia Tech's first touchdown. 7-0 Hokies. A couple of punts later, West Virginia had the ball at their own 38 with three minutes and 31 seconds to play. Nearly three minutes and ten plays later, the Mountaineers tied it up at seven. Mark Bolger hit Corey Ivey on a six-yard fade route. It's important to note that at this point, Mark Bolger was dealing with a finger injury and could barely throw the ball. An ugly and surprisingly low-scoring first half came to a close. The score was tied 7-7. The Hokies got the ball to start the second half. They were able to move the ball 77 yards downfield. Eventually, they were stopped. Shane Graham came out and knocked a field goal through. 10-7 Hokies. Mark Bolger's finger injury had gotten so bad that he was forced to come out of the game. Brad Lewis took over at quarterback. They weren't able to do anything on their first drive, but fortunately for them, Virginia Tech wasn't either. So, the teams exchanged punts once again. West Virginia now had the ball at their own three-yard line. They picked up one yard on the ground on first down. The inexperienced Brad Lewis was initially flagged for intentional grounding on second down, but the officials later picked up the flag after determining that a receiver was in the area. This was especially good for West Virginia, because it would have been a safety had they not picked up the flag. Here we go. Third down. Lewis gets the snap and fumbles it. He was able to fall on it in the end zone, though, preventing a Virginia Tech touchdown. So I guess it didn't even matter that they picked up the intentional grounding flag. The score is now 12-7, and Virginia Tech's about to get the ball back. It's looking like the Hokies might finally be able to break away in this game. Following the safety, the teams exchanged punts once again. Virginia Tech had the ball now, and they were able to move it inside West Virginia territory. On this play, the play clock almost got to zero, and the Hokies were forced to use their third and final timeout with 9 minutes and 40 seconds to go in the game. This would almost come back to hurt them. West Virginia's defense held firm, though, and the Hokies were forced to punt the ball back to the Mountaineers. There's now 9 minutes and 24 seconds left in the game. How great a story would it be if backup quarterback Brad Lewis led the West Virginia Mountaineers down the field and they scored a touchdown to take a lead over the third-ranked team in the country. But they just punted the ball back again. Virginia Tech now had it on their own 42, with 6 minutes and 9 seconds left to go. One touchdown and this game is probably over, right? Vic hit Andre Davis with this beautiful throw here to get the ball down to the West Virginia 5. First and goal, Sharon Stiff got into the end zone. The Hokies now had an 18-7 lead. Frank Beamer sent his offense out there to try and make it a 14-point game. They failed. But fortunately for them, a West Virginia holding penalty gave them another shot. They decided to just kick the extra point this time. 19-7, Hokies. Now, it's really starting to look like this game is over. On the ensuing kickoff, Virginia Tech actually forced a fumble, but Mountaineer Boo Sensiball picked the ball up and ran it all the way back to the Hokie 40. The Mountaineers also got an extra 15 yards after Sensiball was hit late out of bounds. The Mountaineers now had it on the Tech 24 with 4 minutes and 43 seconds to go. It was time for Brad Lewis to cement himself as a legend. It took them 7 plays, but they eventually scored a touchdown on another fade route. It was now 1914 Virginia Tech with just over three minutes to go. All they had to do was pick up a couple first downs, run out the clock, and this game would be over. They started out the next drive well. 
Sharon Stith picked up 14 on first down. They picked up 4 yards on the ground on first down. Then, all hell broke loose. On 2nd and 6, West Virginia was able to force a fumble. A sinking feeling was beginning to grow in the pit of every Virginia Tech fan's stomach. This game shouldn't even be close. But, here we are. Virginia Tech just fumbled away their chance to close out the game. And a loss here would almost certainly end all hope of going to the national title game. West Virginia now had the ball at Tech's 32-yard line, with a minute and 44 seconds to go. On the first play of the drive, Lewis hit his receiver for 17 yards. He was sacked on 2nd and 4 to push the Mountaineers back to the 18. It looked like Virginia Tech had hope again, but that hope quickly vanished after Lewis hit Corey Ivey for an 18-yard touchdown. Just a couple minutes ago, this game looked like Virginia Tech had it in hand, but now they were going to need a miracle to win it. The following drive couldn't have started much worse for the Hokies, as Chiron Stiff almost stepped out of bounds at the 3 yard line, and he got blown up at the 15. Redshirt freshman quarterback Michael Vick marched his troops out to the field for one last chance to preserve their hopes of going to the national title. He was going to have to drive nearly 85 yards and had just a minute and 15 seconds to do it. Bet they're really wishing they had their timeouts now. Fortunately for Virginia Tech though, they didn't need a touchdown to win the game, and they just had to get in range for Shane Graham. Graham made 58 out of 59 extra points that season, and 18 of 23 field goals. At the time of his graduation, he was Virginia Tech's all-time leading scorer, and would hold that record for almost two decades. Here we go. On first down, Vic threw an incompletion. At least, the clock stopped. He made up for it with the 14-yard completion on the next play. Then, he hit Ricky Hall for 9 yards. Hall stayed in bounds, and he didn't even pick up the first down. The clock just kept ticking. On second and one, Vic would go on to deliver one of the most iconic plays in Virginia Tech history. Waste too much time. Michael Vick wasting too much time right now. They're about 25 yards away from a makeable field goal try for Graham. Vic on the roll. He dashed 24 yards down the sideline and got the ball to the West Virginia 36. This is one of those plays that you can't really describe. You just kind of have to see it. Vic could have stepped out of bounds to stop the clock, but he didn't. He just kept running. On the next play, he hit Ricky Hall for another 9-yard completion. They were able to get to the line and spike the ball with 5 seconds to play. It was now up to Shane Graham. For the Hokies, this kick would represent their hopes and dreams of going to the national title. Just seven years ago, this program was completely irrelevant, and now they had a chance to be playing for the title of best college football team in the country. But if Graham missed the kick, the Hokies would lose and have almost no shot at getting to the Sugar Bowl. For West Virginia, this game was a matter of personal pride. At this point, it was clear that their season was going to be a wash. They could have given up when starting quarterback Mark Bolger left the game with a finger injury, they could have given up when trailing by 12 with under 5 minutes to go, but instead they rallied behind their backup quarterback, and they battled back to take a lead over their rival, who was also the third best team in the country. Now it was up to Shane Graham to close it out. Welcome to a moment in history. National title hopes alive from 44 yards. It's long enough. It is right down the middle. Good for Shane Graham. They're still 